Good morning, everybody. We decided we, uh, we weren't gonna have a, an ordinary service today uh, for Memorial Weekend as it's been a short abbreviated week and uh, I'm enjoying some time with the family. Um, but uh, we did put together a, a nice little service here for you today and uh, we're focusing on the ascension of our Lord today. We're calling this an, uh, an interlude in our Revelation series, kind of taking a breath in fact, commentators notice throughout the book of Revelation, there's, there's these cycles of intense visions. And then all of a sudden there's a little, what they call interludes, where there, it's, it's a chorus of praise, whether the angels or the elders, but it's just a pause in the action to let the reader catch their breath. I also want to get political, not partisan American politics political. I'm talking Jesus politics. Jesus' entire ministry was announcing a kingdom, which, friends, is not an apolitical spiritual reality in the by and by. It is rugged summons to allegiance and obedience. Uh, that's what his ministry was all about. And so I'm going to share uh, some of the music today and scriptures and my little meditation are all about preparing us for the political edges of the revelation that John has been given of Jesus, the, uh, the reigning lion lamb. And so let, like good prophets and good art, let it agitate you, let it subvert some, some values, let it put a rock in your shoe. You like the background here? This is what it's like uh, pastoring at a church on a golf course. Not a bad gig. Speaking of Memorial Day, it's always a source of discomfort for me. Uh, probably a healthy tension that the celebration of the ascension of Lord Jesus falls on the same week each year as Memorial Day. Uh, once reminds us that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came to free us from the cycle of violence and uh, of the nation states and the other a holiday that commemorates and memorializes those who have fought in our nation's battles so let that tension just sit there it should make us uneasy and it should make us ask questions about where our allegiance lies and it should make us think about the hopeful vision Jesus has of the day when there will be no more wars, when the nations will smash their swords into plowshares and learn war no more. So we're glad you joined us this day. Happy Memorial Day weekend and make Jesus your king today and always. Says to imitate Christ. Why do you look so much like the world? Because my Jesus bled and died. He spent his time with thieves and liars. He loved the poor and the cost of the so which one do you want to be? Blessed are the poor in spirit But do we pray to be blessed with the wealth of this land? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness but do Ache for another taste of this world of shifting sand. Cause my
my Jesus bled and died for my sins He spent his time with thieves and sluts and liars He loved the poor and the cost and the rich So which one do you want to be? And who is this that you follow? Is how you see him as he dies for your sins But the word says he was battered and scarred Did you miss that part? Sometimes I doubt we'd recognize him Cause my Jesus bled and died He spent his time with thieves and the in my church The blood and dirt on his feet My stain the carpet But he reaches for the hurting And despises the proud And I think he prefer Beale Street to the stained glass crowd And I know that he can't hear me If I cry out loud Child for American prosperity, but like my Jesus, you see, I'm tired of living for success and popularity. I want to be like my Jesus, but I'm not sure what that means to be like you, Jesus. Cause you said to live like you, to love like you. Then you die for me Can I be like you, Jesus? I wanna be like you, Jesus I wanna be like my Jesus Acts 1, 1 through 11 in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, 
Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very own eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You know, this week the church calendar observes the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord. Um, I just want to share a few minutes this morning on um, how my understanding of the Ascension of Jesus has taken on enormously new power in my life. It's radically shaped, shaped a lot of my deepest convictions right now about what Jesus offers the world especially in times like these. Um, the church often has emphasized uh, the life and teachings of Jesus appropriately, uh, especially his uh, sacrificial death on the cross. We celebrate the resurrection as his death-defeating act on Easter. But the ascension of Jesus is a goes with that package. You can't you need the ascension along with the resurrection, along with the crucifixion. And here's why. You see, the story we've been living in, and my people at Main Street hear this quite a bit, that um, we've often inherited a gospel, a Christian story that's all about getting us out of here to heaven as the end goal. And therefore, the ascension, when we read the stories of Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father, like we proclaim in the in the Apostles' Creed, um, you, you know, we think, "Well, oh, great, Jesus is in heaven now, and he's preparing a place and awaiting my homecoming when he'll welcome me to heaven." And there's the story of Christianity. Someday we'll get out of here, and go to heaven. While heaven's important, it's not the end of the story, and it's important that we are recapturing uh, the bigger story that we're called to be a part of. And, uh, and this is exciting because the ascension of Jesus is his enthronement. Jesus is not in heaven twiddling his thumbs or uh, making music with the angels. When Jesus rose and then ascended, he ascended to his heavenly throne where, from where he is bringing his kingdom reign to bear on earth as in heaven. In and through his church, he's trying to establish his reign. And that means we have an active role, not a passive one of waiting to go to our heavenly home. And this is a big shift in thinking, but it's so powerful. Because don't we need to know that uh, Jesus meant it when he said, when he taught us to pray, um, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven and earth aren't far away, two separate uh, locations, one at the other end of the universe. Um, they're more like two spheres. And heaven is always spoken of as God's space. It's where he dwells, it's where his will is done, it's, it's from where he, he operates and, and, and occasionally intervenes in earthly affairs. But the cosmology of, of the scriptures is one of, of heaven just being on the other side of a veil. And sometimes that veil gets really thin, thin places the, uh, the mystics speak of. And um, every once in a while the curtain gets pulled back and you see uh, a glimpse of heaven's activity right on the other side of the veil of our earthly activity. One of my favorite places to go thinking about Jesus' reign and how it is, he is actively involved and engaged in what was going on here on earth is, is Stephen in Acts. Uh, Stephen's one of the early Christians and Stephen uh, bears witness to Jesus in a powerful and courageous way and he loses his life for it. And while he is 
about to die by a, a violent stoning, we're told that uh, he, he looked up and, and, the, and he saw into heaven and he saw as if the, the curtain was pulled back, he saw Jesus not just sitting on a throne passively. It said, it, Stephen saw Jesus standing, standing at the right hand of the Father. And I love that image of Jesus is, he's, he's standing up ready to, to reach out. He, he's paying attention, he's concerned with what's going on. And, and, uh, and in Stephen's moment of need, Jesus is right there reaching over, standing, lunging forward in, in gracious love and giving him the power and strength to, to, uh, to end well to bear witness well. And that's what this world is looking for right now uh, and what it needs is it needs to know that there's someone on the throne. That the history isn't spinning randomly, out of control, at the mercy of, of, of biology. And um, there is a sovereign and he has his purposes. And he is actively engaged in bringing his reign to earth as in heaven. At least a taste of it, but that begins with his people. His kingdom favorites, Ephesians 1. Now listen to this. Are you ready? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, church. And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet. And has made Jesus, him, head over all things for the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. This is an amazing picture of the King of Kings who has all authority and dominion and he's trying to bring everything else underneath his wise and good and just reign. But he's doing it through his church. And uh, there's no more sobering and inspiring image for me as a pastor and a church planter than these, the idea that um, the church, local expressions of the global body church is called the fullness of him who fills all in all. It, it's like Jesus wants to just pour all of who he is and what he does into his people, ordinary misfits like you and me. Nevertheless, we are trying to bring the fullness of his kingdom hope and vision for a new kind of humanity into existence, make it visible to a world that's in need of hope in a fresh approach. You know, I had a kind of a crisis moment in college where I needed to really decide whether I was gonna do this Christian thing or not. I wasn't drawn to the, uh, the, the quaint little story about you know, saying a prayer and becoming a good boy scout, help old ladies across the road sort of Christianity. I thought it had to be something bigger, some story to give your life to. And I remember I was just smashing up against these other stories vying for my allegiance, especially the story of the American dream of becoming a self-made man, getting a good career, finding the trophy wife, having a picket fence and a dog and a nice suburban life. And I just remember seeing how hollow that felt. And yet church, man, that could easily be just a, you know, sit in the pew, sing some songs, have some good uh, meatloaf in the basement, send the kids to church camp. This didn't line up either or inspire me. So I was at this moment of decision in college. And you wanna know what gripped me and pulled me head first into this story of Christianity? I opened up the book of Acts. Everything changed in one reading, and I'm not kidding. I was pulled into this story of the Acts of the Apostles. 
and uh, in chapter one, we just read the scripture today. In chapter one, you get this picture of uh, Jesus is being asked by the disciples, hey Jesus, is finally, now that you're raised from the dead, are you going to um, restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you gonna make everything right? And this is what we do, we often wanna know the what and the when questions. What are you doing, God? What are you up to? When are you gonna act? When are you returning? And Jesus refuses to answer the what and the when when they ask him about the kingdom. Instead, he's interested in telling them the who and the how. And so Jesus says, it's not, it's not any of your business about when the kingdom's gonna come. But here's what I can tell you. You will receive power from on high and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the freaking earth. And this is so exciting. On this Ascension Day, we remember that Jesus rose to his heavenly throne so that he could pour out the power of the spirit of the new creation into his people on earth so that we could begin to live in the power of the Spirit, to show the world a new way of being human, to show the world a new way of wisdom, a new kind of power. And all of these things have been given to us, his disciples, the church, for 2,000 years. But sometimes I wonder if we've been too passive, sitting around waiting to be beamed up out of here when Jesus is waiting for people to open their hands and receive that spirit daily, to go out and bear witness. And yes, in some Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and, and yes, in Mound and Excelsior and Minnetonka, to the ends of the earth. You will receive power, church. Do you feel that exciting invitation well, it was this story that gripped my teenage heart at Bethel University <laughs> around the year 2000. And um, ever since, I've been wanting to be a part of that story. So where do we start? Get practical, Jeremy. I don't know, maybe we start with John the Baptist's slogan, which is so great. He said, I must decrease, Jesus must increase. What if we just applied that to different re areas of our life? In my marriage, I must become less. Jesus must become bigger. My ego must become smaller. And Jesus' example must become bigger. In my political views, Jesus must increase in influence. In my work life, honoring Jesus must become a bigger part of what I'm doing. Building my own ego and portfolio must become less. In my social media interactions, Jesus, his voice needs to come through my Twitter feed and Facebook comments more than my ego, my opinions my angry rants. I don't know if this would make any sense, but his throne must become big. Man, I wish you could all be at St. Martin's right now to see the, uh, the trees just blowing up with blossoms. It reminds me of the kingdom promise. I mean, it's overwhelming to think of how can little groups of Christians possibly turn the tide of culture and make any lasting difference. I mean, the, the task is too big and the problems are too large, but we're reminded of Jesus who said, man, <clears throat> faith movement, just the size of a mustard seed, once God gets a hold of it, breathes on it, it can blow up and become something truly magnificent and big and world-changing. 
So I'm looking at all these seeds blowing around just one of these trees full of, of blossoms. And one gust of wind sends those seeds scattering across this landscape. So the question is, what kind of fruit are we? What kind of seeds have been planted in us and growing? Because listen, there's other kinds of seeds and other kind of kingdoms, other kind of things that are growing in us, from us, both as a church and as individuals. But as we surrender our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, our values to Jesus and get in line with him, the spirit begins to blow and cultivate us as plants that can change the world and make a bigger difference than we realize. So Holy Spirit blow on these trees. Holy Spirit blow your wind on Main Street and all of these branches sprouting out from this tree we call this church. And may the seeds scatter far and wide. And now everything I've just said so far, if you've been following our Revelation series, um, it, this, it all fits together. Everything I've just said is the plot line of the book of Revelation, that God is trying to reveal in the rugged realities of history a picture, to, a, a glimpse of John, chapters 4 and 5, of Jesus, the Lamb, on his throne. Um, he's trying to reorient his people to say no to the uh, Babylon-like governments and rulership and kingdoms and politics and say yes to the politics of the Lamb, of Jesus, of his kingdom. And as we move forward into chapter 6 through 20, these cycles of visions of judgment, it's a big, long, unmasking, exposing of all the dark and um, dehumanizing um, influences of the Babel culture. We're going to meet the beast and the dragon and the harlot. And these are all speaking to worldly kingdoms that are at odds with Jesus' kingdom that he came to inaugurate 2,000 years ago. And the consistent call throughout Revelation is to the church to say, choose your kingdom, choose your culture, choose your king. And will you get caught up in the, uh, the deceptions of the Babylon cultures, which is alive and well today, friends? Or will you choose the lamb? and the kingdom that looks much different. So church, God bless you. And those who are still dipping their toe in Christianity um, know that it is a big story about a God who wants to usher in his age of, of, of love, grace, restoration. And, um, and it begins today as we acknowledge the ascended Lord on his throne and we as people, his loyal subjects. So God bless you today and go live out the kingdom way under our good, gracious, and loving King. Greetings, Main Street. I hope this finds you well. Um, I am also hoping that you have had a chance to get outside and enjoy the uh, weather that uh, we've been having, sunshine and uh, um, blue skies. Um, it certainly is a nice change. Um, this morning, since we have been uh, working our way through the book of Revelation, I thought it would be appropriate to take the benediction from the first chapter of Revelation, chapter, verses 4 and 5. John says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen.
uh, with tears still fresh in my eyes, I just listened to a song again that uh, it's one of the one of my favorites, and I'm going to share it with you today. The compelling blend in Jesus' ministry was that he taught about the kingdom he was bringing at the same time as talking about the loving father embracing all of his prodigal children who are so prone to wander, so prone to chase after other lovers and give their allegiance to lesser things. I want you to consider the scandal of the gospel of a love that is fierce, but good, of a king who is who means business, but who's full of grace. This is a song by Derek Webb, a truly fallible character himself, whose ministry career has had many ups and downs and personal struggles, and he's been quite open about them. And, Sometimes the most flawed artists are the most powerful artists and um, his songs uh, go to some deep places and he's willing to open his soul. And this song is a confession on behalf of all of us of our proneness to wander, to exchange um, our marriage to Jesus with other lovers and um, and where the gospel meets us in the middle of that. So uh, enjoy this song and um, listen to it three or four times to catch the full power of each line. But I pray that this would bring you to the throne that is the throne of grace. No matter where you've been this week, this month, no matter what you've done, no matter how dirty and soiled your clothes seem, no matter how many lovers you have on the side, uh, there's a way home. His arms are waiting and wide open. Okay, good. Am I still cool then? Okay. Pot of gold with the other in your 
Oh 